Hello, Good friend. Morning, everybody. People in the camera are. Well, it's very good for you to take your take on. There we go. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Sorry for the little delay that we're having here. We're going to be with you in a sec. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we apologize for the technical difficulties. So we're about ready to start. Jazz, you are the host. Thank you very much, Karen. And could I please ask if you are not a speaker, if you could please mute yourself, that would be fantastic. Cash rewards means for fifteen dollars or more. Wait, wait, wait. On your next door person. Hi, Jazz. This is Sue. Can you make me a co-host, and I'll um help with some muting. Yes. The folks with their mics still on. We might want to pause the recording until we get started. Morning, everybody, or evening, afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, welcome. We wish all here an early happy Black History Month. To everybody joining us from the Americas, Europe, the Middle East, the African continent, Asia, and the Pacific. My name is Antar Keith. I was born in the Bronx, New York, USA, and I serve as chair of the Democrats Abroad Reparations Task Force from right here in Leipzig, Germany, a country at the forefront of modern reparations history. I invite you to share in the chat where you are tuning from, tuning in from where you vote and in one word what reparations means to you. Reparations or reparative justice has existed as the 400 year old cornerstone of black American political thought beginning long before black union soldiers fought to free themselves during the US Civil War. Like an undying flame, the demand for justice has never once been extinguished despite the earlier kidnapping of warrior soldiers from West Africa, has never once been buried by the pain of chattel slavery, the subjection to black coats, forced breeding mills, and ghastly experimentation. Never once has it been mitigated through the era of political terror following reconstruction, white mob lynching, the lost cause whitewashing of American history and anti-Black voter intimidation and terror, first from the then Democratic Party and today from the Republican Party, not even through American apartheid. Not once has our demand ever been silenced through urban renewal, eminent domain, and the war on poverty, not even dur during the war on drugs, and certainly not during the war on terror today. Our demand stubbornly but refuses to decay, even though our bodies lay mortally wounded in the street, unarmed while racists with badges, smoking weapons in hand, fail to understand that only black people ever die this way. Our demand for reparations has remained resolute, unerringly so, doggedly so, audaciously even, it remains indivisible, refusing to be absorbed by any political party's identity politics at any cost. At its core, reparations represent a solid torch of hope, of aspiration, one of pain, but also of unity and fulfilling a historic duty, or as Dr. Kirsten Mullen once called it, our sacred mission. It represents us choosing neither blue nor red at the ballot, but rather for the first time in our history, us. It represents the promise of restoration, despite generations of accumulated compound damage wrought across the realms of education, employment, finance, law, healthcare, cultural memory, property ownership, civic engagement, and modern voting rights. Although we come from various political backgrounds, philosophy, and ideology, we are united by the hallmarks of a people who have and continue to ex experience an American genocide. It remains a terrible irony then that reparations for wars around the world remain a real tangible reality, while for black folks, a people locked in their own never ending war, reparations remain nebulous, intangible, long relegated to mere fantasy. 
but today is a new day. Next month, as America reflects on Black history, we must also begin to consider our Black future. With each passing week, we see new reparations commissions and task forces popping up across the country. With each day, we are seeing a greater awareness of reparative justice take form. In 2023, we must begin asking not if our government could ever end the legacy of Black intergenerational disparities, but when. Better understand Understanding, uh, excuse me, better understanding the national discussion about reparations and how they would be enacted and implemented is what brings us here today. Though some of us may come from various backgrounds ideologically, what unites us is far greater than anything that could divide us. Your presence here is testament to that. I appreciate all of you again for joining us here. We have GBC Steering Committee member Malika Kasumi here now to introduce a guest who can contextualize the rising call to action we are hearing from California to Texas, from New Jersey to New York. Malika, please. Thank you, thank you, Antar. Greetings to all. I'm excited to introduce William Darity Jr., who's the Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of Public Policy, African and African American Studies and Economics. He's the director of the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. His research focuses on inequality by race, class and ethnicity, school and the racial achievement gap, North and South theories of trade and development, skin shade and labor market outcomes, the economics of reparations, the Atlantic slave trade and the industrial revolution, the history of economics and the social psychological effects of exposure to unemployment. Along with A. Kirsten Mullen, he co-authored From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. Dr. Darity, thank you for joining us. We're eager to hear from you today. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kasumi, for that generous introduction. And uh, I would like to also thank Antar Keith for inviting me to have the opportunity to speak to this community of Democrats who are all across the globe. Uh, I'd like to begin by defining reparations as a program of acknowledgement, redress, and closure for a grievous injustice. By acknowledgement, I mean a declaration on the part of the culpable party that it committed deep harms to others, and the provision of an apology and a commitment to undertake redress on the part of the culpable party. Redress is the act of restitution or compensation to the victims for the damages that have been wrought. This often takes the form of monetary payments. And closure is an agreement on the part of the victimized community and the culpable party that the account is closed, that the debt has been paid. No more claims would be forthcoming from the victimized community unless new harms take place or old harms are renewed. Living Black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States find their prospects limited and trapped by the multi-generational effects of what Antar Keith referred to as genocidal practices that have been, a directed, been directed against them. If we look at the United Nations Convention for what constitutes genocide, they highlight five different practices which go far beyond extreme, the extreme of sheer extermination of a community. These five practices are killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing intended measures to prevent the births within the group, and finally, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. The manifestations of these genocidal practices in the United States are observable in terms of the impact of white supremacy. This would include the ongoing 
practice of discrimination in American labor markets, where individuals, it has been demonstrated in field experiments, that uh, Black individuals without criminal records are less likely to be called back for jobs than white individuals who do have criminal records. Uh, black life expectancy in the United States is seven years less than white uh, life expectancy. In terms of other types of health outcomes, maternal mortality is a particularly telling signal of the degree of, of discrimination that's embedded in American society. Uh, black mothers with the highest levels of education, that is black women who have master's degrees and who have PhDs or professional degrees have the highest infant mortality rates of all women in the United States. Uh, police arrests are also demonstrative. Uh, blacks are, black men in particular, are more likely to be arrested on drug possession charges, uh, 2.8 to 5.5 times more likely than, than white men. And this is despite the fact that there is no substantive evidence of any difference in the rates of drug possession on the parts of blacks and whites. And in fact, some studies suggest that white rates of drug possession are actually higher than black rates. Black men are killed at three times the rate of white men by the police. So there's a huge array of harms and damages that are ongoing to the present moment, but they are an outcome of the history of white supremacy in this country. In the United States context, the trajectory of genocide leads to denial of full citizenship for Black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved here. This is a denial that is particularly acute with respect to the material conditions for citizenship. Those material conditions are captured by the racial wealth gap. The Black-white wealth gap is the best economic indicator of the cumulative intergenerational effects of white supremacy. White supremacy is a product of national policy. It is not merely a matter of personal or individual aggressions or microaggressions. It's far more substantive. It's a consequence of a series of policies that have been introduced by the federal government, either through action or inaction, that have resulted in this huge disparity in wealth that we observe today. In the 19th century, land was the primary object of asset building policy on the part of the federal government. The government promised the formerly enslaved 40 acre land grants in uh, initially along the Eastern seacoast between uh, the, South, the Sea Islands of South Carolina and the uh, northern territories of Florida bordered by the St. Johns River. This was actually uh, a, a promissory note on a full commitment to land allocation to the 4 million formerly enslaved. This particular initial allocation under Sherman's special field order number 15 amounted to 5.3 million acres of land under his special field orders number 15. The ultimate result of this process was only 40,000 acres of uh, 40,000 of the freedmen were settled on 400,000 acres of land out of the 5.3 million initially specified. Uh, and and that, uh, that land was taken away from them uh, on the orders of President Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor. Uh, in in uh, in the process of restoring that land to the former slaveholders. At the same time, the federal government was providing one and a half million white families with 160 acre land grants in the Western Territories under the Homestead Act of 1862. The consequence is 45 million living white Americans are continued beneficiaries of the uh, of the Homestead Act of 1862. In addition, um, there was a host of massacres that took place from the uh, end of the Civil War into the beginning of World War II, which led to uh, property takings 
and seizures of property on the part of the white terrorists, making that property their own and aggravating the racial wealth gap. And there actually were a hundred of these massacres, even though people are probably most familiar with the one that took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, and perhaps the one that took place in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898. But in fact, there was uh, there was there was a hundred of these that took place. In the 20th century, uh, the federal government shifts away from land distribution as its mechanism for asset building to home ownership. But it applies the home ownership project in a highly discriminatory fashion, ranging from the application of redlining measures, which were essentially a public-private partnership between the Federal Housing Administration and local banks, as well as the application and execution of the home buying provisions of the GI Bill. Uh, finally, in the uh, the second half of the 20th century, particularly in, in the 1960s, the introduction of a, a full-scale highway system across the country resulted in the running of freeways through the hearts of Black communities all across America, not only destroying the structure of Black neighborhoods, but also destroying Black business districts. An additional consequence of the massacres was the creation of a Black refugee population that moved out of the communities that had been subjected to these atrocities and had to relocate elsewhere throughout the country. Uh, it is clear that these policies put the lie to the notion that the Black-white wealth gap is due to Black profligacy or dysfunctional behavior. Now, uh, the final thing that I would like to make mention of today is, is the particular vision of what a structure of a reparations plan ought to look like. And this is a vision of the structure of a reparations plan that has emerged from the work that Kirsten Mullen and I have done, as well as the influence of a host of other thinkers about how American Black reparations should be conducted. There are four features. The first is the determination of who should be eligible to receive reparations. And we anchor the concept of eligibility on the fact that the federal government has a debt that it owes as a consequence of its failure to provide the 40 acre land grants to a very specific segment of the uh, black community in the United States. And that's the individuals who are descendants of persons who were freed at the end of the Civil War. So we argue that eligibility should be contingent on two criteria. The first is what we refer to as a lineage standard. And the lineage standard has it that an individual must demonstrate that they have at least one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. The uh, second, second condition is what we refer to as an identity standard, which is for at least 12 years before the adoption of a reparations plan or a study commission for reparations, uh, an individual would have to demonstrate that they self-identified as Black, Negro, African-American, or Afro-American. The second uh, component of an ad adequate reparations plan must be uh, the determination of the amount that should be distributed to the eligible recipients. And uh, in the work that we've done, we've argued that the racial wealth gap provides that critical indicator or index of what should be uh, due to the, uh, the descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. We estimate that the amount that would be required is $14 trillion, and it would be equally distributed across the 40 million or so uh, eligible recipients of, of reparations. Uh, then the third component of this is, uh, is who would pay? And that is the federal government, because it is the culpable party, but it is also the capable party. Uh, one of the things that's a bit troubling that's been going on lately is this array of piecemeal reparations projects that have been proposed nationally uh, in many, many cities and across states. Uh, but there, there are two difficulties here. The first is that uh, states and localities cannot meet a bill that would be sufficient to eliminate the racial wealth gap. The total combined budgets of all state and local governments in the United States is less than $5 trillion. And the bill for reparations is at least the $14 trillion that would be needed to eliminate the racial wealth gap. But the second issue is 
uh, the conditions of white supremacy that were implemented through national policy are primarily a consequence of federal policies. So not only is the federal government the capable party, but it is also in a fundamental sense, the culpable party and bears responsibility for meeting the debt that has long been unpaid. The final component of the uh, of the reparations plan that we have in mind is that there should be a mechanism of direct payments to the individual recipients, that that should be a priority. There may be other uses of a total reparations fund that goes beyond the amounts that are required to close the racial wealth gap, but the primary focus of the project must be direct payments to the eligible recipients, just as other reparations initiatives for victimized communities have made direct payments to the eligible recipients, uh, including the German government's payments to the victims of the Holocaust or the United States government's payments to Japanese Americans who were subjected to mass incarceration during the course of World War II. So uh, that's that's those are the fundamental four pillars of a reparations plan. Uh, and I'll be glad to talk about any dimensions of these issues as we move forward in the conversation today. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Darity, for sharing your ideas and concepts with us. Uh, we're so grateful that you're here today to speak with us, to share this important and critical information, sir. Uh, right now, what I want to do is I want to jump now to, um, you know, uh, the next kind of dimension in this kind of paradigm. Uh, I want to really start off just by asking uh, uh, our uh, guests, what do Black voters demand in exchange for our political capital? I ask this because merely staving off a red wave has not and will not prevent the next George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, or Kenan Anderson. After recently speaking with my brother and reparationist in arms, Baba Kim, I learned how much power Black voters have. In order to use it properly, we must understand the power we have politically speaking. The Democratic Party as a political entity from 1960 to right now has only managed to win the majority of the white vote a mere 6% of the time in the general election. Just like the late great Malcolm X illustrated in his famous bullet on the ballot speech, white voters are, have been, and will be divided. From the 1960s until today, Dems have only wielded executive power a measly 6% of the time, uh, would have wielded it only a measly 6% of the time if they depended exclusively on the non-Latino white vote. Meditate on this. If the white vote and unsuppressed black vote were counted alone, then 75% of all presidential elections, that is from 1960 until today, would have resulted in democratic victories. Without our participation, hypothetically, the same number immediately drops to 12.5%. In a system where there is no viable democratic pathway to victory, without black political participation, we have been the kingmakers. This is why the GOP tries so hard to stop the black vote in particular and why Dems fear losing us. Over 87.5% of the time Dems have won the White House, it has been due to the black vote, our vote boosting the democratic minority of total white votes, tipping an otherwise skewed balance of power in our favor. Quite simply, when black folks are allowed to vote, Dems win. When our vote is suppressed, the GOP wins. When Black voters are divided, we lose either way. Yet the time of us giving away our vote, our power, without collective bargaining for our repair is over. We must come together this year, no matter our philosophy, and we must begin to build consensus for a Black agenda that our elected leaders must be beholden to. Otherwise, will continue to be subject to the typical tap dancing opportunists, empty rhetoricians, and politicals performing kente cloth clad acts of fake allyship. We must learn how to link the reparations movement to electoral politics and repair the nation through reparations. With this in mind, Malaika, can you please introduce our next guest? Let me unmute. Thank you so much for that passionate uh, introduction, Anta. 
I'm also very excited to introduce um, Miss Nina Turner, known as, I quote, hell raising, a hell raising humanitarian, and as well as a tireless advocate for progressive values and social justice. She made history in 2005 and 2008 as the first woman and African-American woman, respectively, to represent Ohio's 25th district as state senator. She promoted progressive policies through her work with the Ohio Democratic Party, Bernie Sanders' 2016 and 2020 presidential campaigns, and during her time at Our Revolution. Turner is a former assistant professor of history at, I hope I'm saying this correctly, Cuyahoga Community College and host of the Hello Somebody podcast. Turner is currently the host and executive producer of Unbossed, a show that airs daily on the Young Turks Network. Ms. Turner, thank you for joining us today, and we're very eager to hear from you as well. Well, thank you, Malika. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of my sisters and brothers and family and friends from all over the world. It is indeed a beautiful thing and always exciting to hear Dr. Darity uh, talk about the uh, reparations as he is him and Ms. Mullins have been working on, on this for decades and to bring this really to a level that we all can understand the masses can understand through the book that they wrote is indeed a beautiful thing. Antar I was a man and you every word that you were saying it really is time out for the black community and any of our so called allies to continue to accept less than nothing. You know, I had a mentor, she is on the ancestral plane right now, but her name is Fanny M. Lewis. She served as the longest serving councilwoman in the city of Cleveland's history thus far. And she has this mother wit about her like the women of her era did, very much like my grandmother. And she used to say, it doesn't matter whether you meant to kill me on accident or on purpose, dead is dead. And so we have a situation in this country and also in this world where we do have forces and powers that reveal themselves in the physical who really do mean to kill the spirits, the hearts, the minds of black people, some on purpose, others by accident. But as Councilwoman Fanny M. Lewis once said, dead is dead. And so to destroy the very core soul and being of black people who are descendants of those who were enslaved it is a generational proposition as dr darity has laid out and it is one that this country has yet to address i would dare say i mean we're going to tackle the united states of america first but all the imperial powers all the colonizers actually do owe all black folks a debt and we can tackle that one at a whole nother time but that is really what we are dealing with black folks in the diaspora. So we need to have a family conversation about that as well. But I'll put that in the parking lot. On the political, in the political plane, yes, it is true, Antar, everything that you said about how the Democratic Party itself has been able to win elections across this country, especially federally, and especially for the presidency has came because of black folks. A lot of folks vote, different people from racial, ethnic, identity, groups vote for the Democratic Party, there is no doubt about it. But the loyalist base of the Democratic Party is black folks. And I would argue that in the 21st century, and it pretty much was the same in the 20th century, but in the 21st century, black folks went from being the mistress to the side piece. See, the mistress at least gets some trinkets from time to time. The side piece gets absolutely nothing. And that is what black folks have gotten absolutely nothing. So I want to say to my black sisters and brothers and family and friends, and those of you who are not black, you can listen in on this family conversation. When will we stop being complicit in our own demise? When will we stop allowing the Democratic Party to whisper absolutely sweet nothings in our ear? And when they get into these offices, they do absolutely nothing to edify and to lift the black community from a systemic perspective. See, I'm not talking about them black folks who get to go to the Christmas party. I ain't talking about those. I'm not talking about the Clyburns of the world. I'm not talking about those. The Hakeem Jeffries of the world who was picked 
to be the successor of the former Speaker of the House, Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi. I'm not talking about them types. I'm talking about the types that Big Mama and Big Papas cultivated in hoods all over this, this country, whether they're rural hoods, urban hoods, or suburban hoods. I'm talking about a systemic lift of Black people that can sustain itself for generations. And as Dr. Darity laid out so clearly, the major thing that has to be done to be able to do that so that Black folks don't have to worry about who's whispering sweet nothings is reparations. And for those who claim to be allies of the Black community, you have got to be able to say very clearly with us by our side, not trying to take over the space and take over the room, that reparations is the order of the day. It is long overdue. You know, we just celebrated the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I can't tell you sisters and brothers and family and friends how much it pained me to see so many elected officials in particular, because I want to rest on them. We're going to dress them up a little bit who pontificated and tweeted and went and gave speeches about his life and his legacy when they really know nothing about the radical king. I invite you all to read the book that was edited by the one and only Dr. Cornell West titled The Radical King. See, they don't want to talk about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who condemned this nation for his racism. They don't want to talk about the radical king that condemned or indicted this country for its materialism, its militarism, and its anti-black bigotry. No, that's not the one that they want to talk about. They want to talk about the one that says that he lives, he wants to see a day where people are not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. But what they forget to understand is that Dr. King indicted the character of this nation along with people like Minister Malcolm X, along with people like Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, along with people like Fannie Lou Hamer and others. Let us not forget, sisters and brothers and family and friends, that Fannie Lou Hamer from Mississippi, a sharecropper, was able to galvanize her colleagues, both black and white, and indicted in the 60s, this very Democratic Party that Antar just got done talking about. And they created their own party together based on what they had in common, that they were catching hell, not heaven, catching hell because they were poor, because they were black, and then our poor white sisters and brothers as well. So I'm using that as an example to say that it is time out for the black community to continue to give its votes to a party that does absolutely nothing other than to give us trinkets. A few black people in high places and high spaces does not mean that the black community has been liberated economically, socially, political, politically, physically, mentally, spiritually, that has not been done at all. And so the black community has to make a decision. It has a decision to make whether we're gonna keep giving away our, our vote. Vote is power, so you got to be able to make a demand. Let me bring a few words from the one and only Frederick Douglass, an abolitionist, as we all know. He advocated and, and spoke up and fought against the ills of this nation, and at the same time, loved this nation. I will say to you all, don't nobody love America more than Black folks. Nobody. We love this country. Although this country has betrayed us time and time and time again, and we ain't got to go all the way back. We can look at the great recession that just happened a few days ago on the spectrum of history where black folks left lost over half of their wealth through their homes. We ain't got to go way back. We can look at what just happened just on January the 7th to Tyree Nichols at the hands of a vicious system that does not see black lives as beautiful and worthy. I argue, I surmise to you sisters and brothers and family and friends that what we saw those black police officers do to that black man was sick. And it is a sickness in this country that can be pushed and revealed through people who even look like us, like me. That it is a systemic failure that policing in this country came about to not protect and serve the black community, but to lord over it and to treat us as if we are less than animals. And we saw that manifest, unfortunately, at the hands of five black men who are kicked out of the damn tribe. They out. 
They got to go. And I hope the full force and weight of the legal system barrels down on them. But let us not forget as quickly and as swiftly as justice has started to percolate around them, where is that swiftness and that quickness when black people die at the hands of white police officers? Where is the black uh, Blue Lives Matter crew? Nowhere to be found, not justifying what those officers did, but we got a conundrum on our hands, America. We got a problem on our hands. And in some cases, we have got to admit that this legal system cannot be reformed. It must be torn down and reimagined. And for anybody that saw the tears of that mama as she talked about her baby and being able to feel his pain, there is no way that we cannot say that there is something cruel and unusual about this, this system, but it is not an anomaly. And so the shock that some people feel because you saw it at the hands of five black officers, I surmise to you this morning, this afternoon, tonight, whatever time zone you are in, that those five black officers are a product of a system that is racist, that is anti-black, and that is rooted in white supremacy. And we ask law enforcement officials to somehow upend the very nature that they have been culturated in that they've been socialized in, that we all have been socialized in to see black bodies and black hearts and black minds as somehow unworthy. So I didn't mean to get off on that tangent. Well, yeah, I did mean to get off on that tangent. All of this stuff is linked because you cannot say that you love black people. The great novelist Jane Ball, Baldwin once said that you cannot say that you love the tree and you hate the root. And we must admit in these United States of America systemically, I'm not talking about individual racism and individual bigotry. I'm talking about systems have been created and reinforced that shows every single day that they don't give a damn about black bodies. And so what are my son and my grandchildren and other people's sons and daughters that we cannot as a country grapple with this? You had elected officials just a few days ago. When I say a few days ago, I'm being very sarcastic, but a question was asked, does, does racism and bigotry still exist in this country? And you got the current vice president who said it did not. You got Senator Tim Kaine on the Republican side, or Tim Scott, excuse me, who said it did not. And I don't care who these people are. Again, black faces in high places does not change the conditions by which black people find themselves suffocated from. So on the political realm, black folks have got to decide we just not gonna take this no more from Democrats or Republicans. And let me not lead these Republicans, today's Republicans off the hook. Listen, I'm not letting them off the hook, but the reason why I indict the Democratic Party more fiercely is because they get over 90% of the black vote every single time. When Democrats had control of the House, the Senate, and still have control of the presidency, they were told that the, that the George Floyd Policing Act was going to pass. It didn't. When the Democrats had control of the House, the Senate, and the presidency, we were told that the John Lewis Voting Rights Act was going to pass to try to undo some of the damage in Shelby v. Holder at the hands of the United States Supreme Court. It didn't. Workers in this country were told, we're going to pass the PRO Act. We didn't. Rail workers were betrayed by the 118th Congress at the hands of the president, the transportation secretary, and the Congress. We must, we must, particularly the black community, but we need some allies and we need some co-conspirators say that we ain't going to take it anymore in the spirit of a Fannie Lou Hamer who stood up to President Lyndon Baines Johnson, so much so the brother had to have a press conference to stop her truth from percolating. She indicted the Democratic Party, and we need that moment once again. Finally, because I can keep on going with this, from the words of Brother Frederick Douglass, he said this, and I want y'all to understand me and understand me clearly. When I quote these words, I want you to listen to what? Listen and not just hear. Listen. He said this, those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation 
are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both, but it must be a struggle. Power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. That is it. So to the black community in particular, when you make a demand, if people don't answer the demand, there must be a consequence. And the reason why the Democratic Party continues to get away with not answering our, to our needs is because there is never a consequence for them not meeting the demand. And the Republicans are just useless, especially on the federal level. And we're going to have to deal with them too. Lastly and finally, for real this time, the duopoly in this country is a problem, sisters and brothers and family and friends. And while we are focusing specifically on Black people, let me put another thing on this, that working class people from all backgrounds have been betrayed by the duopoly who answer to their, co their corporate owner donors. That's why we can't have nice things in the United States of America. That's why we don't have universal health care. That's why the pharmaceutical uh, companies can control the price of prescription drugs is because the owner donors are in full control of this oligarchic nature of this representative democracy in these United States of America beyond answering and redressing the ills and the criminality of chattel slavery and black codes and Jim Crow and Jane Crow. We have got to deal with this system that allows poor people to languish and not be able to live a good life because the type of people we elect to office only care about the owner donors and do not care about the big papas and the big mamas in this country. We must make a demand and make sure that there's a consequence. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Turner. Um, <clears throat> so what I would like to do now is I would like to open this up to our audience um, and provide a little bit of Q&A for both uh, Dr. Darity and Ms. Turner. Um, you know, uh, if you would like to ask a question, first things first, type into the chat box, star, star, hand up and you will be put into a queue. There are people here who are willing to um, make sure that you have a, you know, the proper time to ask a question. I uh, you know, stress just because there might be a lot of, well, I feel like there will be a lot of people asking questions. Um, please try to limit your questions or comments to about one minute maximum. You know, and you know, try to generate actually questions along with your comments. If you do have a comment, great. But if you have a question, uh, even better, because we are really trying to begin what should be a very engrossing conversation that will not just end at the end of this event, but will continue to go on and on and on. This is the conversation of our time, the conversation of reparative justice in America. Okay. Okay. So okay, hopefully I'm not echoing anymore. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be monitoring the queue and when you hear your name, you'll be asked to unmute, I believe, or um, and then um, you'll be allowed to ask your question. So first up, I see we have Wanda. Wanda, I, I think um... that's my, my 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 question is how do we take this very urgent, compelling agenda for what I call slavery justice, real reparations, reparative justice to a higher court? And the way the reason why I say that is because we are all aware that America has not responded. And I think we need to have a dual approach to getting to reparations. Um, in, in the, in the, on the federal level, 
there has been no real activity that will result in the actualizations of reparations checks. The payment, direct payment to the descendants of formerly enslaved black people, which I am a 72 year old black woman who comes from a history of slavery in America, enslavement of my ancestors and the accountability. I don't see it happening on a federal level without an international court mandate from the UN to hold America accountable for the human rights violations and the atrocities and horrors of our enslavement. Everything to this moment relates to that in our journey. Even what we saw played out in Memphis goes back to how police were established to patrol, to harass, to capture, to hold in prison uh, in, enslaved black people. That's how, that's how the police force was established. So that mentality is a reflection of our oppression. But I won't talk, I'm talking now about the UN. Uh, how can we get an agenda that takes us from where we are now to a higher international court to try America, to put America on trial, to be held accountable? That's my question. Uh, and I want to applaud everyone today, especially our highly esteemed you know, dynamic chairwoman and everyone on this committee for the work that we're doing. But I think we need to have an international agenda to hold America accountable beyond the corridors of Washington, D.C. How do we do that? Well, I would say, I mean, certainly we have a example in Minister Malcolm X. Some of you may recall mm -hmm. it, whether you, you know, lived it or you studied it a bit, that Minister Malcolm X did just what you were saying, that he took it to a higher, to a world court, so to speak, and indicted this nation for human rights violations against African Americans. I mean, there is no reason why uh, we could not do that today. One of the things that he said is when you expand the civil rights struggle to the level of human rights, uh, he said this on April the 3rd, 1964, you can then take the case of the black man in this country before the nations, plural, uh, to the UN as a vehicle. So there is no reason why that cannot be resurrected again with a 21st century spin. At the same time, I don't think these things are either or. We still must do battle right here on this soil before the federal government to force them to do uh, what should have been done a long time ago. Uh, I, a couple of comments. Uh, first, uh, in the late 1950s, Queen Mother Audley Moore brought a case to the United Nations uh, for the harms of genocide to uh, Black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States. Uh, I don't believe at that point anything came of it, but very recently, prior to the pandemic, the United Nations Working Group uh, on Peoples of African Descent said explicitly that reparations is due to Black Americans. The difficulty is that the United Nations and other international courts of justice or their equivalent have no capacity to enforce anything. Uh, on any country throughout the world. Uh, I think that in terms of international unity, there's more success to be won by having uh, communities of Black people across the diaspora who have claims on specific colonial powers or specifically on the United States uh, to support one another. So, for example, when the uh, the people of the Congo are making a claim on the Belgian government, by all means, I think uh, Black Americans should endorse that. Similarly, I think all the nations of the African continent should take a step like refusing the entry or continued presence of U.S.-owned corporations 
in their countries until the United States government provides reparations to Black American descendants of U.S. slavery. Uh, but I don't think that the International Court of Justice or the United Nations has the capacity to make this happen. We have to have a political movement internal to the United States to compel the United States Congress to do the right thing. So we have to change who our elected officials are. We have to have elected officials who would be willing, if necessary, to stack the Supreme Court in the event that a reparations plan is adopted. Is this possible? It is possible, uh, but it's going to be very difficult. The reason why I say it's possible is because there's been a sea change in American attitudes towards reparations. Uh, we wouldn't be having this type of a conversation in this group if we were only five or six years in the past. At the beginning of the 21st century, in the year 2000, a study that was done by Michael Dawson and Ravana Popoff indicated that only 4% of white Americans endorsed monetary payments as reparations for Black Americans. By the year 2018, that figure had risen to 15%, still quite low, but not as low as 4%. And then as of last year, and in a study that was replicated just a few days ago by the University of Massachusetts, the figure for white support appears to be closer to 30%. Can we sustain that momentum? Can we build a movement? Well, that's the challenge before us. Thank you so much for that question and those um, really insightful answers. Next up, we have Malika. Malika, are you able to unmute? Yes, I, I have. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank both of you, um, of Dr. Darity, of, of giving a new face to genocide, or seeing the other side of it's important, and also to you, Ms. Turner, of stripping away racism as, person, as a personal choice, as a political result. That's really important. My question is this, though. Where do we go with our vote? That's that. That's the problem. There's we have nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. We have a vote. Where are we taking this vote? Um, I know that there are a number of black people who are Democrats or people, all of all colors, Democrats, not by choice, but by lack of choice. And if you go into the system, how can we be in the system and change the system? What is it that we can do? What can I do? Me, Malika, one person. Besides saying from we, that's my question to both of you. You're Certainly, like you bring up a very good point of where do we go? And that's exactly what the power structure wants us to say all the time. That is how the Democratic Party and the Republican Party both comport themselves, but especially the Democratic Party when it comes to Black people. I mean, let me tell you something, being in some of these rooms with that kind of attitude, where are they going to go? What else are they going to do? They want us to feel that way. And so while what you just stated is a reality that we have to grapple with, we don't have to continue to live with that. We can run candidates and support those candidates who will do our bidding, period. So we don't have to be stuck in that. Another real thing that could happen, and it's happening all over this country in different municipalities, is ranked choice voting is another option that takes some of the air out of the two major parties. So in terms of an activism or, or something that people may want to work on, it's going to take a longer time to get that to be the case on the federal level. However, ranked choice voting is an opportunity to blunt that kind of full frontal force from the two parties. And it is one of the reasons why the two major parties do not like a uh, ranked choice voting at all to, to level the playing field. And then lastly, in dealing with the reality that we have, I, I need us to really think and to focus on the fact that there is power. We do have power um, that we can, can flex our muscles. I mean, Ace, Ace of Philip Randolph comes to mind, one of the greatest uh, unionists of the 20th century where he made FDR, you know, desegregate the, 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 the armed forces, uh, black, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of black folks were put to work because he said to the president, I'm coming to march on you. That was in the 40s. FDR couldn't have that because on the world scene, World War II was going on and he was out there saying, you know, we, we, we are the example. We can't be the example of black folks marching on Washington. 
So we have to, this, this goes beyond marching. Marching is a tool. It's one of the tools in our toolbox. It's not the only tool in our toolbox, but we need to draw upon some of the actions and acts of our ancestors or our predecessors. Many of those people are still walking the face of this earth. So let me just say not everybody's in the ancestor or plane and combine that with some of the new tools that we have and not be afraid to say that there will be a consequence. We are gonna to have to endure some pain, but we've been enduring pain for generations. We cannot allow the Democratic Party to get away with saying, well, we are the lesser of two evils and you gotta pick one of us. No, we do not have to pick one of them. And then lastly, attitudes about third parties is really changing too. Uh, more and more Americans are saying, uh, especially younger people, but certainly in my travels all across the country, uh, I've talked to some seasoned folks too, who are tired of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and want to see a third party emerge because they care about the life that they have left, but more importantly, they care about their children and their children's children and what kind of nation are they going to inherit. And my last point on all of those points that we can never we cannot allow power structures to make us feel so helpless that then we play the game by their rules. If that had been the reality of black Americans in this country, Africans, and then their African-American descendants, then the prospect of the abolition of slavery would have never happened. You see, that is the realest example that I can give you. Yes, was it hard? Absolutely, did people make sacrifices, bloody sacrifices, mental sacrifices, physical sacrifices? Absolutely. But if just think, if they had played by the rules that were set before them, the notion of the 13th Amendment with its flaw would not have come to pass. So we have to make a collective decision about how hard we are willing to fight and what sacrifices we are willing to make to get there. And all of the examples that I'm giving you is not an either or, it's an and. And I want you to see it that way because it's not just one thing that's gonna get us there. It's multiple things that are gonna get us there. And even though going back to the point about the UN, even though I don't necessarily disagree with Dr. Darity's point about the UN not having the, the power to force the United States to do anything, as a matter of political tactics, this is my tactician, you know, the politician in me, as a matter of tactic, to take something before the UN would be a beautiful thing. And at the same time, taking every other step that I have mentioned and also Dr. Darity has mentioned as well. So it's not one thing, it's all of these things. No, I, I would only uh, in, endorse uh, endorse uh, Nina Turner's point about the importance of third parties evolving that actually have some heft. Uh, and you know there's there's actually an, a, an effort underway that's being led by uh, Eric Smalls to establish what he's calling a Freedman's party. Uh, and there are other, types of efforts to establish uh, third parties. The presence of third parties does not prevent coalitions from being established with, uh, with the existing dominant parties, uh, but it may also put pressure on them to alter their direction of change. So I think that's important. The unfortunate thing is we're in a very, very dangerous time we're always in a dangerous time, but this one is 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 acutely dangerous because the Republican Party is a vehicle for the introduction of full scale fascism in the United States, and so that's that's why you know the the Democratic Party has the advantage in that situation of getting the black vote because the 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 shift of the black vote to the Republican Party is so extraordinarily dangerous at this moment, uh, but it it leads to the situation that that Nina Turner's talking about, where the Democratic Party can depend on the black vote without doing anything for black people, and it didn't do anything for black people when Barack Obama was president. So let's let's be clear about that. Uh, and so. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the development of viable third parties is really, really a critical component of this process. Definitely. Okay, great, thank, thank you, you so much. Next up we have Adrian.
Adrian, are you um, there and able to? Yeah, no, I, I was unmuted. I think someone muted me. Sorry. Uh, I just oh. want to say thank you so much, Dr. Darity and Sister Nina Turner for being with us today. Um, and all of the insights that you've made are just so important. And I think for our members, membership as Democrats who live abroad, it's really important um, to hear these points of view because we have a lot of members who have not lived in the United States before, or um, you know, they just have not had the political uh, education that I feel is required that I grew up with, you know, that you all grew up with. Um, and I think this is a really important question about how we address this in America. Um, so I'm making more of a comment than a question, really. I think um, yesterday we celebrated the Holocaust Memorial Day, and there's, you know, increasing evidence that people across the world don't believe that it happened. Uh, they don't understand what happened. They don't know the historical value of it. And we have in the United States at the moment, a governor in the state of Florida, like Ron DeSantis, who is banning uh, AP history courses about African-American studies. So for me, this is, a, I mean, it's a two-pronged thing. I think the, the educational part is very, very important. And this will increase our, um, the viability of third party in the United States. But um, I think also within the Democratic Party, it is about accountability. And so for me, as a member of Democrats Abroad, I'm holding our leadership accountable for their knowledge or lack of knowledge um, about these issues and also um, about what it really means to be an ally at this time. And I would like to hear you know, your perspective about how we can improve that with that, because we do have to, the fight is within the Democratic Party as well. I think um, for now, that's where it sits. So I would like to hear if you have any um, thoughts about, you know, how do we hold our own accountable? I mean, definitely we gotta have an inside and outside game, game a plan. I mean, the only way to hold people accountable is to one, make the demand, and then there has to be a consequence for the demand. So if we were keeping a report card right now, what are the things that would be on that report card? You know, as an educator, and Dr. Darity and I both are that, and you know, I would have my students in my class and I let them all know, first day of school, everybody got an A. Everybody in this class got an A today. It's your job to keep it. So when it comes politically, we do not analyze uh, these elected officials through those that type of lens. I voted for you, this is your score right now. It's your job to keep it, how do you keep it? Well, these are the things that you got to do to keep it. We need the George Floyd Act passed. I mean, these are minimal things uh, that Black folks are asking for. This ain't even pie in the sky stuff that Black people are asking for, and they couldn't even do that. So when the midterm came, I analyzed my students. Some students still kept the A, some had B, some had C's, some had D's, some were borderline F's. And I said to them, now you got X number of weeks to make this right so that you can get a good score in this class in the final analysis. That is the same thing with these people that we elect to office. So we and we can run people too. I mean, let me tell you, as a national co-chair for Senator Bernie Sanders campaign in 2020, and certainly I was with him in 2016, I want you to think about how a, a senator from Vermont, one of the smallest states in this country, was able to go up against juggernauts and raise grassroots dollars to do it. I use that as an example because we can, we can raise up the consciousness of people in this country and all around the world to the plight of Black people here, pull our resources, our time, our talent, and our treasure to get people to move. And um, the fascism point that Dr. Darity brought up, I totally agree. Black people are always saving this nation. But you know what my question is? When, are, when is the Democratic Party going to act like neo-fascism is a threat? Why is that burden solely on black people to constantly save this country from neo-fascism and accept the lesser of the two evils? When are Democrats going to comport themselves as if neo-fascism is a clear and present danger in such a way that they are pushing and passing policies that change material conditions? See, they not acting like it's a clear and pre present danger, but the burden is always on black folks to act like it's a clear and present danger, which it is. I am not minimizing that. I think neoliberalism kills you slowly. We are witnesses and neo-fascism kills you quick. So 
they gotta have an obligation to do that. But I want no one to leave this 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 gathering today thinking that we are helpless. We are not helpless and we are not hopeless. But it will require a great deal of planning. As my dear friend Michael Render says, AKA Killer Mike, we gotta plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize. And that takes a lot of work. When we think about notions of justice, it's all up here and we think of it in some high-minded way as we reflect on black history and how far we've come. But yet we forget to go deeper to realize the blood, sweat, and tears that was given to even get us this far, that the whole notion of justice is not pretty. It's, it's hard work. People lose lives and livelihoods, even if they don't physically die in the fight, in the pursuit for justice and liberation. And so that is the mindset by which, in my opinion, we have to approach this thing. And that it is a generational journey that the first you pass in batons. And so now the baton is in our hand to advance that justice. And then we're going to pass it on to the next. And then they got to advance justice. And they're going to pass it. And it will never, ever end. But are we going to make the type of progress that then sets a solid foundation? And we got to do that through the realm of politics, electoral politics, but also activist inside outside game to pressure these people to do what it is we want them to do, including running our own people against these folks and not falling so in love, sisters and brothers and family and friends, with these elected officials that they can't be critiqued for their job, not for their individual personalities, but for the job that they were elected to do. All right, um, then I suppose next up we have Friday. Hey, good morning. Um, I always enjoy the conversation that you all host. So um, I'm just grateful to be here. But my questions, and I put them um, in the chat, it's a two part question for Darity. Um, the first part being, could he get into the difference between harms based model for reparations versus lineage based? It seems to me in the reparations community that that, that is kind of the, the split or the assessment um, that municipalities are facing. And two, um, in terms of validating or documenting a harms-based model um, and evidence or proof that you would need to pull versus um, with a lineage model, the genealogical records, could you just discuss what the difference is um, in those documentations would be and what the potential impacts would be if municipalities chose one or the other. So I don't think that the dichotomy is between harms-based and lineage-based approaches to reparations design. Uh, by harms-based, I, I interpret that as uh, the identification of a set of atrocities that have been committed against the community. And then uh, you try to uh, calculate some amount that is due for each of those individual atrocities and then add it up to arrive at a, uh, a, a total figure for, uh, for the compensation that's owed. Uh, you can always uh, precede that approach by saying there's a particular community that's eligible to, uh, to obtain compensation for those harms. And so you could use a lineage-based criteria as a prelude to establishing a harms-based approach. So they're, they're not mutually exclusive. What, what is different is the approach that I've been talking about today, which is instead of trying to, uh, to calculate a sum of compensation that's due by adding up a price for each of the atrocities that have been taken have taken place instead find a single critical indicator of the cumulative effects of those atrocities that can be measured economically and that's that's why uh, in in the work that I've done with Kirsten Mullen we focused on the racial wealth gap as, as that type of indicator. So I would say that the distinction is between an approach, the harms approach being an itemization strategy versus 
uh, an approach that says you try to calculate this by finding a single uh, comprehensive indicator of the consequences of the damages. But, but either of those approaches can be preceded by defining an eligible population for, for compensation. And that could include the lineage standard. So, so the lineage standard and the harms model are not uh, not things to be juxtaposed against one another. All right. Thank and you for that. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Next up, we have Martin. I believe my question has already been answered. What I wrote was that what options do African Americans have if they don't vote Democrat, the Republicans win, and that's not good. If they vote Democrat, then they become trinkets, as Ms. Turner said. Uh, either way is not uh, satisfying. What options? are available then. Did I, I think I understood him to say his question has been answered already? Is that, or is he asking a new set of questions? Yes, my question I think has been answered. Okay, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Issa, um, I think is unable to unmute. So I'm going to read out what they sent in the chat. Um, Issa says, honestly, despite being pro reparations all my life, I did not know the VA denied the GI Bill mortgages in the 40s, 50s and education did not know, oops, did not know the Department of Agriculture took farms from black families that redlining was law, that Northern cities had sundown laws, the whole state of Oregon was a sundown state. Um, and he says, there are too many details we do not yet know. So um, this seems like a comment, but if there was a response, I think that's, he's open to that. <laughs> just just one side sidebar on the GI Bill. Uh, the GI Bill's educational provisions were not, uh, applied differentially to the degree that the home buying provisions were applied. The difficulty with the education provisions was that there were a limited number of, of seats for the returning black GIs because of segregation in higher education and their, uh, their ability to only attend what was then a handful of historically black colleges uh, and so as a consequence, uh, uh, they, they all could not take advantage of the GI Bill for the types of programs of, of study that they had in mind. Uh, and then in addition, the agents who were uh, executing the GI Bill tended to channel the black GIs towards vocational programs rather than uh, degree granting programs for, uh, for BAs or, or bachelors of science degrees. All right, and then the last um, person we have in the queue um, is actually another um, special guest, Terrence Wynn. Um, we were speaking earlier about the United Nations and Terrence um, actually in August was in Geneva, Switzerland, testifying before the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination um, about his experiences about mass incarceration in the United States, about environmental racism, and so, Terrence, we're really glad that you are here today um, to join us and uh, share what's on your mind. So feel free to unmute and take it away. Uh, uh, I am privileged to be on uh, in the sign of Europe very uh, about to speak. But I think that, that we as Black people, we're taking for granted. So that's why everybody with a problem, he can just get a superseder, get a, get a jump over. That's why we had a black president that didn't address the black problem. So we speaking to the Democrats. 
the Democrats feel like the blacks automatically get, get their vote when it shouldn't be like that. Because when the prison population blossomed, it was the Democratic Party that led that charge. President Clinton. I'm a I'm a, a person that was a victim of that that system. I did thirty years in prison from the age of sixteen up until I was forty six years old. And I felt the effects of that every single day when he signed the anti death penalty act. And a lot of people don't know about that. But I can tell you firsthand about that. And Clinton did a, a real disservice to to the black community. And in and, and general, and specifically to the prison population, because it shut doors down for us. A lot of innocent people remain in prison because of something he signed into effect. And they use up crack the same way that the Republicans use up crack. So it's speaking out the, uh, two sides of the same mouth to say the same thing about the black community. It's like we justify and doing whatever we do to you because y'all want to use this drug, this drug that our government brought to our, our community. And we suffer so much that we deal with our problems through drugs. We just try to numb ourselves to the pains and the problems that we face every single day. That other people, they got remedies for them. We, we cry out for remedies every single day. And so people get tired of crying. That's why we just had a chance to take slavery out of uh, the Constitution here in our state. But people refuse to go vote because people feel like they vote don't even matter no more. It's like when you talk to black people, if you've got your boots on the ground, people, they're quick to tell you, man, that why should I vote? People don't listen to us. They'll tell you that they're going to do this. And then when they get in office, they don't do nothing. They do it for everybody but us. And so people are just saying, why do I need to uh, participate in the process of vote? It doesn't benefit us. And that's a sad situation. Because I know it benefits us. And so we look at crime situation. Recently, a few days ago in my neighborhood, eight people were shot. One person has succumbed to her injuries. So she's gone. She's dead now. And people look for solutions to those problems. And a lot of solutions to those problems reside behind board. Like like I am. People people follow me because because I went through that experience. People knew that I lived in these streets and I did the wrong thing. And now that they see I'm doing the right thing, so they'll get behind me because of me doing the wrong thing. It's, it's the thousands of black people who've never did the wrong thing and they are out front doing the right thing, but people don't really follow that. It's like, how can I get you to fix a problem for me when you've never you've never suffered it? You've never endured it. So people want the people that actually experience what they're going through. How can, you know, we look at doctors or we look at people that are speak about prison problems, but they've never been to prison. So how can you tell me? You, you're telling me this from studies. But you're studying people that have been to prison, and you still can't tell me that experience. But people that listen to people like me because I know that experience. So I don't need no, no paperwork, no fancy doctrine to tell you how it feels to be isolated for 23 hours a day or how it feels to lose your mom and your dad behind bars and have to come home shocking and handcuff where you can't even scratch another part of your body. I can tell you how I feel to wake up every single day and have to go to work in a field. And you can't call the N-word about white people on horses with big walls of tobacco in their mouth. And they beat you when you stand up like a man. And it be, when, you, when we think about what just happened in, in, uh, in Memphis, you see that every day in prison. But it's white guards doing it. And you'll have a black guard putting his boot on you. And they'll drag you down concrete on your leg. By your shackles and handcuffs, and all your skin is tearing off your body because you want to be a man and you want to speak. So can't nobody that's never lived that experience tell me anything about it. But that's who we 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 get behind the people that's got these fancy doctors to tell you, yes, this is what he is going through. How you know what I'm going through? You've never been through it. And so people that's living these traumatic experiences within our ghettos. 
they don't want to hear that from people that's never did it. That's why nobody, no suit and tie, can walk through the ghetto and get people to respond to them. But you can take me in this in this hip hop gear. I can walk through it. You know what they're gonna say, man? That's T. Win. They're gonna get behind me. They're gonna respect me because they know as a 16 year old boy, Towns Win went to prison. As an adult, he went to Angola, the roughest prison in Angola. And I came out a man. And I came out with my sanity. And I came out way more educated than I did. So those experiences combined with the education makes people want to follow me. So I listen to Miss Connor, and I love it. And, I'm, and you know, you, you get me going. You make me think about Nat Turner. You make me think about Denmark Vesey, Gabrielle Prosser. You make me think about the greats that no one speaks about in our history. We speak about Dr. Martin Luther King because he did great work. We speak about Malcolm X because they did great things. But those that's hidden. Now we're taking a train of thought from blacks from the, from the education from the education department, so blacks can't learn anything about black history. So that's another injustice that's done to us. Everything is done to us, and we really don't stand up for it. It takes us to die for people to stand up, and then some of us die, and it goes overlooked. So we look at swift justice, but I can look at Alton Sterling looking at the police shoot this man down and die and have no justice come. I can look at Ronald Green, who just was killed by the police here in our state, and ain't nothing being done by this. It took three years for that to happen. But these black men, they was arrested on the scene. I can tell you about Ronald Green's fan. He killed a, in, 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 in St. Marksville here. They killed a little a white boy. They was arrested on the scene. But ain't no white people getting arrested for killing black people. But we scream black lives matter. But it don't matter because what they use up is the crime within the black communities are being done by black people. So how can black lives matter when they don't matter to you? And I understand that we need to love one another. We need to start doing for more for one another so that people can, so that we can see one another as human and so that we can see one another in a more respectful way of seeing people so that when we're hurt by a situation, we don't take our hurt out on one another. So it's understandable. So that means I got to look in the mirror first. Every single day I got to look in the mirror and I got to say, man, I love me. And then me loving me, that means I'm going to love anybody that looks like me. I'm not going to take anything away. And so we have been praying for years in this, in this, in this country. Black people have always had to pray. I mean, white people don't even must believe in God. And I'm not speaking to all white people, but I'm saying the earlier people and a lot now that's in positions that make these decisions on our everyday life. They don't much believe in the, in the how you're being. Terrence, so Terrence, Terrence. Believe. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, brother. So, you know, that's Terrence Wynn. You know, he is uh, the chairman of Pipes, which is a community organization in the community helping people. And, you know, Terrence, I know you're fired up, brother. I'm fired up too listening to you. You know, um, uh, I really, really want to thank you for that. So, um, you know, somebody could pop uh, Terrence's contact information in the chat box. And, you know, for those who want to work with him, this is boots on the ground organizing of uh, the dispossessed, the hurt, the um, ones rendered indifferent, um, shunted off to the peripheries of the political spectrum. Terrence is doing the work to bring them back in. But, you know, uh, these communities, these dispossessed and, you know, subjected to deprivation communities, I should say, uh, they're looking for a champion. They're looking for someone who listens, not, as he said, a person with a suit on, you know, a black face in a high place, you know, just to get up to uh, the White House and then pretend, oh, look how much uh, 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 progress we've made as a people. You know, he's looking for people with an inside outside strategy who want to be held accountable to the communities that they purport to represent. And really, um, across America, even outside of America, Black people are looking for that. And we've been looking for that for around 400 years or so. So um, as we um, you know, come up past the hour and a half mark, I just want to um, ask uh, Dar uh, Dr. Darity and uh, Nina Turner if you guys have any final remarks you would like to share. Well, I'm, I'm absolutely- uh, Well, uh, you know, 
uh, Miss Turner, you know, if you like, you can also you can also go first. Oh, that's all right. You can let Dr. Darity go first. That's fine. Uh, um, I don't think I have anything to say beyond what uh, Terrence Wynn said. It's very powerful. Yeah, amen to that. I was going to say to Brother Terrence, run, baby, run. You know, um, your testimony, you can't have a testimony without a test. And this brother has been tested and he is a personification of perseverance and strength very touched by everything that he had to say. And I think we need uh, the brother brothers and the suited brothers. We need all the brothers out there doing the thing on behalf of our community. I, I just want people to lead this call knowing that it is not hopeless and we're not helpless. Um, the great President Nelson Mandela of South Africa once said it always seems impossible until it is done. And we have many examples from history to draw upon to give us the strength and the fight and the might that we need to know that we can keep on keeping on, that we can keep pushing to the high mark, that it is not over for us or any others that come after us. But the future is only going to be bright if we utilize our strength and our power today to deal with the challenges that we face and to be courageous in pushing ahead so brother terrence baby just sending you love i mean so much love and you just keep doing what you do whether you run for office i think that's another uh, fallacy that we make thinking that everybody got to run everybody don't have to run for office we need some people on the inside and we do definitely need some people on the outside and just want to close with grandma my grandmother who was born in 1915 couldn't read or write but she could count her money and she had what we call in the black community mother wit and she would talk about these three bones the wishbone the jawbone and the backbone and i know dems abroad uh, have heard me say this before so for those of you who are new to this story because i just want you to carry this with you because i see so much potential and fire in this group but i also feel that sometimes what we're trying to surmount what we're trying to accomplish seems as though it is impossible to do but it is not impossible so the wishbone is for hoping and praying because hope is the motivator, but the dream is the driver. We as human beings are motivated by hope. If we lose hope, we lose everything. It is the fuel that makes us push beyond what we ever thought that we could do. The jawbone is for standing up and speaking a type of truth, the same way that Brother Terrence just did just a moment ago. You got to have the power and the tenacity to be able to stand up and call it exactly what it is without sugarcoating it but my grandmother said the most important bone of them all is the backbone because the backbone will give us what we need to keep standing and even if we stand in alone we must stand anyhow that has been the legacy and the commitment of black people in the words of Zora Neale Hurston's whose skin has been kissed by the sun that generation after generation there have been those of us within those generations who have had the courage and the capacity to keep on keeping on and to stand anyhow. And when you are fighting for what is just for what is right and for what is good, you can never be wrong. So Dems abroad, I applaud you. This is probably going to be the best Black History International. This is probably going to be the best event I attend all year, baby. I just want you to know it. And to know that I'm always, always at your service. I want to thank you all so much for your support of me personally as an elected official, um, especially when I was running for Congress and and uh, you supported my efforts even when I was in the Ohio Senate. So I just love you so much. And just to bring a world community together is a powerful thing. And there are going to be very few groups and organizations that can bring people together from all over the world in the way that the Dems abroad have, have done. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay, so um, with that being said, what I'll do is um, I'm going to just pass it over very briefly to uh, uh, Bruce Murray, uh, chair of the Global Progressive Caucus for Democrats Abroad. Uh, Bruce, I know you have a couple of uh, items that you'd like to just share with people. If you could uh, ever so briefly um, just elaborate what these items are and, uh, you know, any other further information you would also like to share um, with uh, our organization, well, our allies here. Thanks, Antar. And thanks to our amazing speakers and to all who asked questions and made comments. 
I want you to look at what I wrote in the chat box. It's getting to the end of the meeting. And I want to uh, just summarize it in one sentence. And that is that as the chair of the Global Progressive Caucus, I want to emphasize that we are honored to walk, to stride hand in hand with the reparations task force, Democrats abroad and all our allies on the road to reparative justice. We are here to help. We want to uh, take the next steps with you together. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, so now um, with that said, uh, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for attending. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Darity and Miss Nina Turner. Um, you know, we're fired up uh, and this is um, only the beginning of a much lar a longer and what will eventually be a much larger conversation that I am entirely certain will have national political ramifications up to the highest level. And this is only the beginning. So again, thank you, everybody. And um, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with um, you know, information regarding uh, the reparations task force at the global level, as well as initiatives and outreach at the national, state, and even municipal level. And um, we'll be sharing information from our ally allies across the nation and across the world. Um, so with that being said, we can end the recording now. And um, yeah, 